Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the sixth annual social science lecture on this campus. This even if I squint, it's because these lights are up here, and I don't know whether we'll be able to do anything for our uh, guest lecturer or not, but perhaps something may be done. They are supposed to add to our beauty. <laughs> it's necessary, but I don't think a very successful experiment. <laughs> This event, this annual social science lecture, is presented to you under the auspices of the UCLA Committee on Public Lectures in cooperation with the local chapter of Pi Gamma Mu National Social Science Honorary Society. The purpose of this annual lecture is to present to the faculty, students of this campus, and members of this community distinguished contributors to the advancement and understanding of the social sciences and the part they play in human affairs. In this age of nuclear energy, space men, and awesome wonders and terrors of modern science, the role of the less spectacular and much less public, published uh, social disciplines in the development of mankind and society is far too easily underestimated or ignored. One distinguished physical scientist recently stated, and I quote, that we have entered the infancy of the scientific society which has been envisaged for several generations by men of such diverse vision as Edward Bellamy, H.G. Wells, and George Orwell. Science is losing its place as a curious and isolated appendage of the social order and is being used systematically as a generative enterprise. The result is the quickening velocity of socio-economic change." End of quote. I am not just sure what that statement means. <laughs> but I venture to suggest that man's greatest challenge today, as in the past, lies not in the realm of the natural and physical sciences, but in the area of the economic, political, and sociological problems for which he must find solutions if he is to progress to the goals to which he seemingly aspires to say nothing about achieving sheer survival. I venture also to suggest that the mysteries of man are much more profound than the mysteries of nature and that the resolution of man's social problems in their various aspects is not only a more complicated matter, it also demands the greatest wisdom. It is in the social sciences that wisdom meets its supreme test. For this to be used effectively, it is necessary that the scholar and practitioner translate their thoughts for and their findings to those who, particularly in a free society, must choose their leaders and courses of action that are to be taken. Here, however, man encounters his greatest difficulty. He moves relentlessly to an unknown future from a distant and not too well understood past. Furthermore, by the actions that he takes, he continuously shapes and molds that future in ways that, at best, he can comprehend, although possibly only dimly, by an analysis and appraisal of the road he has already traversed. A theory of history, imperfect though it may be, is a sine qua known to intelligent policy for the future. Tonight, we have with us a man who has spent most of his life trying to unravel a pattern of consistency from the record of vicissitudes, failures, and triumphs of man's sojourn on this earth to date. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to ask Vice Chancellor Foster Sherwood to introduce tonight's distinguished guest to you. Thank you, Professor Pegram, and welcome to this annual event in which we take much pride and in which we are so glad to have you participate. Our speaker this evening studied at Winchester and Balliol College, Oxford, and served for a time 
in the British Archaeological School in Athens. As a graduate of a classical education, he developed an interest uh, during and immediately preceding World War I in contemporary affairs and their relations to the past. He participated in the activities of the Foreign Office during the First and Second World Wars and was a representative of his government at both the First and Second Paris Peace Conferences. He has taught at King's College in London and in the years from 1924 on was engaged in a variety of activities as director of uh, studies at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, in which capacity he served until 1955. He has been a regular visitor to our shores, visiting with us in the United States almost every year since the end of World War II. He is currently a visiting professor at Grinnell College, and this, in turn, he has been able to combine with a variety of other activities that, were I to describe them in detail, would take the balance of the evening. Where our lecturer gets his energy, his drive, I do not know. He has spent most of the day today answering in his inimitably courteous manner innumerable requests for appearances and other uh, addresses. Uh, even this evening during dinner, he was interrupted at least once for that purpose. He is best known for his monumental study of history, a work which occupied a major, though again not all, of his time between the years 1921, when the idea for the work uh, first uh, sprang to mind, and 1934, when the first of the volumes that make up that impressive essay uh, made their appearance. Between 1934 and 1961, these volumes have appeared with amazing frequency and have been the subject of considerable debate and, I venture to say, have done more for social studies than any single work uh, in our time. It is my great pleasure and honor to present Professor... <laughs> One thing one cannot do is prevent. <laughs> to present Professor Toynbee, who speaks to us tonight on the balance sheet of history. Thank you for your very kind welcome. And Mr. Vice-Chancellor and Professor Pegram, ladies and gentlemen. You mentioned, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, that I spent a year in Greece after leaving the University of Oxford. Um, I went to Greece to study ancient history, which I was going to teach, so I thought, for most of my life. And I uh, spent a year walking about with a rucksack on my back and uh, spending the evenings in Greek villages. And there, quite unexpectedly, I learned not about ancient history, I learned something about that too, but about uh, contemporary international affairs, because this was the years 1911 to 12, and the people in the Greek villages were talking about whether the war would occur next fall or the spring after, and uh, what advantage or disadvantage Greece would get from the war. Now, I, at Oxford from 1907 to 1911, had never heard about uh, a coming war. I learned about it from the Greek peasants in the Greek villages. <laughs> who, uh, this may sound incredible because uh, half my contemporaries were dead within three years fighting in that war, but it came to us quite out of the blue, but not to the Greeks. They, these quite simple and, uh, in the formal sense, uneducated but very intelligent people uh, knew what was coming. 
So my first introduction to international affairs was that it was in the Greek countryside. I didn't then suspect that I should spend most of my life in uh, studying and writing about uh, international affairs. Well, now, if we are trying to cast up <coughs> the balance sheet of history, um, this is surely only an interim balance. At least, uh, let us hope it is an interim balance and not the final account. Uh, because, um, uh, so far as we know, the human race in 1963 is only just at the beginning of its history. Uh, men of science who study the um, uh, origins of the human race uh, still differ considerably, I believe, in the um, number of um, hundreds of thousands of years they give us for the antiquity of man up to date. But I think the longest estimate is not more than a million years. It's only, at, at the most, a million years ago that the human race uh, appeared on the face of this planet. And they uh, uh, tell us that the expectation of uh, life on this planet, um, if uh, the planet is allowed to remain habitable, is of the order of about 2,000 uh, million years. Uh, that is, uh, at least 2,000 times as long as the human race has been in existence uh, up to date. Uh, this places a great responsibility on our generation to allow the human race to continue. <laughs> and uh, I was talking about the existence of the human race. If we think in terms of uh, civilization, that didn't begin till uh, more than about 5,000 years ago. So our interim balance sheet, um, if we were to work it out today, would cover only an infinitesimal part of the potential lifespan of the human race. Now, when we draw, draw up uh, an interim balance sheet now, uh, we find that uh, in our time, we've presented ourselves, I suppose, with the most formidable challenge that the human race has faced. Um, let's say, trying not to exaggerate, within the last uh, 20 or 30,000 years. Uh, I suppose it was about uh, that time ago, as far as we can judge, that uh, uh, late Paleolithic man um, finally invented weapons which enabled him to get the absolute uh, conclusive mastery over all other wild beasts except himself. Uh, uh, from that time onwards, man was secure against every kind of wild animal except man himself. Uh, since that time, he has turned his weapons uh, upon himself and his uh, fellow human beings. But of course, it's only in our day that he has had weapons of an annihilating character. He's perhaps done as much um, uh, injury and damage to the human race as he could with the feeble means at his power uh, so far. Uh, today, his means are no longer feeble. His responsibilities are increased in proportion. I suppose the present challenge to mankind is really, put in very simple terms, this. Since time immemorial, since as far back as we know anything about the history of the human race, our ancestors have been tribal-minded. Uh, in the atomic age, we have to feel, we have to think, and we have to act in global terms, terms of taking the human race as a whole as a single family. In fact, the tribes of man have to learn, and learn quickly, to behave like a single family. And this requires a portentous uh, emotional and uh, intellectual revolution. The emotional revolution, of course, is much more difficult than the mere intellectual one. It is fairly easy to see that this is, uh, in, with one's mind, that this is a necessity for survival. But to change one's feelings to correspond to what one sees with one's mind is a harder task and uh, certainly a slower task. So we have to ask ourselves, what are the prospects of our achieving this big uh, in internal revolution inside ourselves uh, before we uh, commit mass suicide? Because if we do not achieve this revolution fairly quickly, it looks as if we are going to bring some uh, unexampled disaster upon ourselves. The distinguishing characteristics of human nature, one perhaps is curiosity, one thing that makes us study the sciences and uh, the, the human studies, but curiosity presupposes consciousness. 
uh, and consciousness uh, includes, uh, brings with it, uh, some freedom of choice, at least. Not complete freedom of choice, but some freedom of choice. And freedom of choice uh, involves drawing a distinction between um, uh, right and wrong choices, and choice means responsibility. Now, I suppose today about 80% uh, of the power of, of the, in, in this world is shared between two countries, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. So uh, these two countries have on their shoulders, and especially the rising generation in both these countries, uh, has on its shoulders uh, the 80%, let us say, of the responsibility for uh, ensuring the uh, survival of the human race. That is a very, very formidable responsibility because um, we have inherited the gift of life handed down to us by our ancestors since our pre-human ancestors first became uh, human during this short first million years of uh, human history. If there are still 2,000 million years of history possibly to be lived, that means um, 6,000 uh, million uh, coming generations uh, pleading to be given the same chance of life that uh, we ourselves have, be, have been given by our predecessors, pleading that we in our time do not wind up uh, human history. And that, as I say, the responsibility for that uh, lies to an overwhelming extent on the shoulders of the rising generation in uh, two, but two only, uh, great countries out of the hundred mostly small countries into which um, uh, the human race is uh, still at this time divided. Now, when we're dealing with uh, inanimate nature, uh, right and wrong uh, mean uh, effective or ineffective for our purpose, whatever our purpose may be. Uh, there's no moral issue in our choice when we're dealing with uh, inanimate nature. But when we're dealing with uh, other living creatures, and above all with um, other human beings, uh, right and wrong have, as we recognize, also an ethical meaning. Uh, an ethical meaning which matters more than uh, the intellectual meaning. They mean ethically good or bad. As Professor Pegram said, we've been uh, enormously successful in our dealings with uh, inanimate nature. Man seems to have an unlimited uh, um, intellectual capacity for uh, um, harnessing, discovering the secrets of uh, physical nature and harnessing them for his own purposes. Um, this is purely intellectual action. Morals doesn't come in here. Uh, technology uh, reinforced during the last three centuries by science, uh, deliberately directed towards research and the application of, of research, has performed these marvels, and I suppose these will pale before the marvels that uh, uh, future scientists uh, will achieve. We've, on the other hand, we have been enormously unsuccessful uh, in our dealings uh, with each other as uh, fellow human beings. This field, this field of human affairs, the field that, of course, really matters to human beings, uh, um, technology is uh, uh, a neutral force and uh, can be a plague or a blessing according to the way in which we apply it in our relations with each other. So the fundamental thing, obviously, in human affairs is human relations. And uh, this field, anyway, during the first 5,000 years of civilization, is a field that has been sown with tares, with envy and hatred and uncharitableness, with meanness and uh, dishonesty, uh, with uh, rivalry and with war. In fact, a human being's relations uh, with himself and with his fellow human beings is the slum area of human life, the uh, uh, area which we can take pride and take some credit is the area which matters less, the area of our uh, increasing mastery over physical nature. Now, since the earliest point in history uh, to which we can peer back as we look back into the past, there's always been, I think, um, an unresolved contradiction in a human being's relations with his uh, fellows. On the one hand, our consciousness and our conscience tell us that creatures that share our own distinctive human nature are our brothers and that we ought to treat them as such. On the other hand, 
we actually treat, and our predecessors always have treated, the majority of our fellow human beings as if they were, in some sense, beyond the pale of moral and social obligation, um, and certainly beyond the range of, of love. We treat them as strangers, as foreigners, or in other words, as potential enemies. Now, this distinction, I suppose, has always been inhuman and uh, immoral. And the question with which we are faced today in the, at the dawn of the atomic age is, can we make a break with a tradition that goes back to the dawn of history, of human history? Because in the atomic age, we must either break with that very ancient and deeply rooted tradition of uh, separateness between different branches of the human race, or sooner or later, we must bring some incalculable calamity upon ourselves. I think it's encouraging to note that already in the past, there have been partial breaks through the barrier uh, dividing uh, one's own minority of the human race from the alien majority, because the aliens, the foreigners, have always been the majority, and uh, one's own uh, nationals have always been the minority of the human race because so far uh, uh, every uh, local country, state, uh, people, nation has always been a minority compared to the human race as a whole. I think today, looking back uh, over the uh, history of the last 5,000 years, one's um, eyes become uh, riveted on the would-be world states. I say would-be because uh, uh, no state in the past has ever been a, a world state in the literal sense of including the whole living generation of the human race and covering uh, all the habitable lands on the face of this planet. I'm thinking of uh, states like the Roman Empire at the western end of the old world or the Chinese Empire at the eastern end. Uh, states whose uh, citizens felt that they were members of a community uh, embracing the whole human race. Of course, if you uh, uh, look at the globe and plot out the area covered by the Roman Empire or the Chinese Empire, it is a very small area of the whole habitable land surface of the um, planet. Um, and we know that for about uh, two centuries, the Roman Empire and the Chinese Empire coexisted on the face of the planet. Uh, and they coexisted very comfortably because uh, just with the tips of their antennae, they brushed against each other once or twice. They were hardly aware of one another's existence. I sometimes wish that it were possible for uh, this country and the Soviet Union to coexist in such blissful ignorance of each other as uh, the ignorance of the Romans and the Chinese for each other. How much more comfortable and safe it would be for both of you and for the rest of the world. Unfortunately, with our present admirable technological means of communication, uh, that is no longer possible. Then there have been other uh, uh, prognostications and uh, um, attempts at uh, the uh, unity of the human race. I'm thinking of the would-be world religions. Um, so far, uh, no single religion has ever converted the whole human race and we are not in sight of such a thing happening. But there have been um, religions of world religions um, in the sense that their founders and their missionaries have deliberately set themselves uh, the objective of uh, uh, preaching the gospel to the whole of mankind. I'm thinking of Buddhism, the earliest uh, missionary religion, and of Christianity and of uh, Islam in particular. Those three religions all have set and do set themselves the uh, goal of uh, one day including the whole human race. Um, they're not worldwide, but they have the conception of the unity of the human race uh, um, in their minds and built into their uh, whole uh, aims and uh, objectives. There is one um, ideology today which is awkward for its neighbors because it um, has the same uh, uh, missionary ambition. But I suppose uh, communism would never have uh, conceived the idea of uh, converting the whole of mankind 
if it hadn't uh, arisen, as it did arise, in a Christian and uh, Jewish environment where this was uh, part of the, uh, uh, something almost taken for granted uh, in uh, any religion. It should be a missionary religion and uh, should try and uh, preach its uh, gospel to the ends of the earth. So it's true that so far, uh, no state uh, and no religion has ever succeeded in making itself literally global. But the citizens of world states and the adherents of world religions have experienced the feeling of uh, being members of a society embracing uh, the whole human race. Um, subjectively, uh, the Chinese empire uh, was the whole world and the Roman empire was the whole world. Their citizens um, um, didn't feel themselves to be uh, citizens of a sectional community. They felt themselves to be citizens of a world community. They knew that there were uh, other communities outside their frontiers, but for all they knew, those were rather backward and barbarous uh, people on the fringes of uh, civilization. Um, as they saw it within the limits of their knowledge in their time, uh, the civilized world uh, was substantially included uh, within the frontiers of their own empire. Um, the eastern end of the old world has, of course, been far more uh, successful in achieving and maintaining unity than the western half was. The Roman Empire existed uh, for not more than about four centuries uh, at its rather barbarous western extremity, even in the central and eastern provinces, which were more advanced and civilized. It only maintained itself uh, uh, for about uh, 600 years. The Chinese Empire, which was uh, founded towards the end of the third century BC <coughs> by the unification of uh, a large number of states that till then had been splinter states uh, uh, perpetually at war with each other. The Chinese Empire has lasted uh, off and on uh, from the third century BC to the present day. It is true that uh, at the eastern end of the old world too, uh, there have been breaks in continuity, there have been periodic uh, breakdowns of the unity of uh, Eastern Asia. The latest of them uh, began in 1911 when the um, uh, uh, Manchu re regime uh, crumbled in China uh, and lasted till about eight, nine, 1929 when the Guomintang uh, reunited China. Uh, since 1929, first under the Guomintang regime and later under the communist regime, China has been uh, united uh, which is its uh, normal condition uh, through the ages, in very great contrast to the western end of the old world, which has never succeeded in reuniting itself since the Roman Empire went to pieces there in the uh, fifth century of the uh, Christian era. Um, and we are told that by the demographers that by the end of uh, this century, uh, more than half the human beings who will be alive in the year 2000 will be uh, citizens of the uh, Chinese state. If we think of uh, conditions under the would-be Roman world state, which uh, was rather an unsuccessful attempt at a world state compared to the Chinese attempt, we may look uh, rather wistfully back. Um, the Roman world state, I think, uh, solved uh, very successfully the uh, uh, wish for local variety with the necessity for world unity by a system of uh, dual citizenship which is uh, familiar to uh, anyone who, like yourselves, are citizens of uh, a uh, federal state. Uh, think of St. Paul. He was uh, very proud of being a citizen of his uh, local hometown, the Greek city of Tarsus in the southeast corner of uh, Asia Minor. But he was uh, far more proud of being a citizen of the world state, <coughs> the Roman Empire. Um, and his uh, Roman citizenship and his loyalty to Rome was paramount over his loyalty to his uh, uh, local uh, city-state. Um, uh, that is familiar in uh, any federal state. You have uh, two degrees of loyalty and the loyalty to the federation is always paramount over the loyalty to the local constituent state. And that, I believe, is the situation at which we have to arrive um, in our relations between our loyalty to the human race and our loyalty to the uh, uh, particular local state of which we happen to be citizens. In the atomic age, our paramount loyalty has to be transferred to the human race as a whole from uh, some single part of it. Because unless the paramount loyalty of the human race is given towards uh, 
preserving the human race and ensuring its survival, there will be no human race and then uh, there will be no uh, national fragments of it. Uh, the future of the national fragments is bound up with the preservation of the human race itself, and therefore our concern for the preservation of the human race as a whole uh, must come first. I look back with envy to uh, the demilitarization of the Roman Empire. At the time of the Roman peace, if you uh, um, traveled northwards from Rome towards the Rhine frontier of the Roman Empire, you would meet um, with only a 1,000 soldiers at uh, Lyon uh, on all the way from Rome to the Rhine. Never in history again have there been so few soldiers between Rome and the Rhine as 1,000. And um, if you took a ship and uh, went southwards from uh, Rome to Carthage, uh, you would find another 1,000 soldiers at Carthage, and then you would travel through North Africa southwards and find no more soldiers till you reached the uh, cordon of uh, Roman troops along the northern edge of the Sahara Desert. Never again in North Africa since that time have there only been 1,000 uh, soldiers between the Mediterranean and the Sahara Desert. Uh, very desirable, very happy state of affairs which we have never succeeded in uh, recovering uh, so far. This competition between our tribal loyalties and uh, ecumenical loyalties uh, for capturing the imagination and the allegiance of the human race. This competition has been inconclusive up till now. Um, large parts of the human race for certain periods of time uh, have been uh, united under states in which uh, uh, the overriding world loyalty was paramount over uh, local, national, or splinter loyalties. <laughs> But that, on the whole, has been an exceptional state of affairs uh, so far. Uh, but in our time, the moral problem involved in this struggle has been brought to a head by the accelerating progress of technology stimulated by science. I suppose the moral question has always been the same. The, the rights and wrongs of um, uh, how we should regard our fellow human beings are no different uh, today from what they uh, were in the past. But the penalty today for sectional feeling, the material penalty, is going to be far more severe than it has ever been in the past. Technology has uh, done several things, I think, that have brought us very sharply up against this human moral problem. Uh, technology, by, as we say, annihilating distance, uh, has, uh, by that, uh, made a literally global uh, worldwide unity possible to organize from the technical point of view. Technically, there is no problem whatever uh, involved in uh, setting up uh, a world government. Uh, think of the uh, uh, size of the world. Today, you can uh, travel over this country and uh, communicate from one point to another uh, as rapidly or more rapidly than um, in the 5th century BC you could communicate between one point and another of the tiny territory of the single uh, Greek uh, city-state of Athens where the furthest point of the territory from the capital was uh, only 40 miles. But uh, you had to walk those 40 miles <laughs> and if you wanted to hear Pericles or some other Athenian statesman uh, talk to you about the political questions of the day, you had to uh, physically go to um, Athens and uh, uh, sit in the assembly, stand in the assembly and uh, uh, be within um, uh, hearing distance of him. Today, the President of the United States can uh, reach with his voice and with his uh, face through television the whole uh, citizenry of uh, this vast country uh, far more quickly and effectively than Pericles could uh, uh, reach uh, an Athenian citizen only 40 miles away from uh, the capital of that uh, miniature state. And what is true of uh, this country is equally true uh, of the whole world. If there were such a thing as a world government, the uh, members of that could communicate with uh, human beings all over the world with uh, equal speed and uh, facility. So, uh, uh, so there's no... Uh, uh, technological impediment to uh, uh, world government. Technology has given us the tools, it remains for human nature to uh, do the job. 
Then secondly, of course, technology has invented the atomic weapon and uh, uh, so has made uh, world unity not only possible but uh, imperative. Uh, we may say, of course, it is true that world unity uh, exists uh, already for the um, insane purpose of uh, destruction. I suppose it is already true that uh, a um, missile launched from uh, any point on the uh, surface of this planet can um, destroy, say, 10 million human lives or 100 million human lives at any other point uh, on the surface of this planet. Uh, as an arena for uh, mass murder, the planet is already a social unity, but that is a criminal and a mad form of uh, uh, unifying the human race. If we don't want it to be unified in that way, we have to unify it in a more human and more civilized way than that. Now, the circumstances uh, in which this uh, challenge has been presented to us make it uh, particularly difficult uh, for us to solve. For hundreds of thousands of years, the tribes of man have been living in isolation from each other, and uh, we've therefore developed uh, different traditions, different manners and customs, different outlooks, uh, different values. And then, owing to the unexampled speed in our time of the uh, development of technology, we've suddenly been confronted with each other at point-blank range, and at the same moment, a deadly weapon has been placed in our hands. Now, this sudden new situation has produced mutual fear, and uh, mutual fear, as always, produces mutual hostility. And being still strangers to each other, and same time physically right up against each other, we don't know what is in each other's minds, and we therefore have no confidence in each other. Now, that is our uh, very painful and awkward situation. Now, this state of mind of uh, suspicion and uh, hostility, mutual suspicion and hostility, is very human and uh, very natural, but it is uh, a state of mind that we cannot afford and we have somehow to reverse. We have to see through our superficial differences, um, large though they loom, strong though our feelings may be about them, these differences that divide us, to the underlying common humanity that unites us. And we have to learn to regard our human variety um, not as being um, um, something to be uh, hostile to, alarmed at, uh, indignant about, but as being part of the common inherited treasure of the human race. Now, it's true that in the uh, atomic age, we have to achieve uh, political unity for certain purposes. I suppose there are two obvious purposes. Uh, one is to the, some kind of centralized control of uh, atomic power, um, and the other is uh, uh, some kind of uh, centralized control of the production and distribution of food because uh, at the very least estimate, the uh, population of the world is going to double and uh, treble, um, probably by the end of this century, it may increase uh, many times more than that, uh, because we have gloriously achieved a sens sensational reduction in the premature death rate of the human race, even in backward countries that has been achieved by fairly simple public health measures, uh, we have not achieved a corresponding uh, uh, reduction in the birth rate because that cannot be achieved by administrative action. It can only be achieved by uh, the uh, will of uh, hundreds of millions of uh, men and women who have to be persuaded and who have to educate themselves. And self-education in a big change of habits uh, takes time. And during that time, at the minimum, the population of the world will have uh, doubled and trebled. And that will bring uh, Malthus's problem, uh, which he stated uh, more than a century and a half ago, into actuality. Uh, after Malthus had uh, uh, reckoned that, uh, had warned us that uh, the world's population was going to walk away from the uh, world's uh, food supply, uh, the great grasslands of uh, the heart of this country and Canada and of uh, the Argentine and Australia were uh, opened up, and the problem was postponed. In our time, the problem, uh, uh, belatedly, is going to come upon us with its full force 
uh, because the effect of uh, public health measures is going to more than neutralize the uh, increase in the area of cultivation and even the uh, increase in the yield per acre, that marvelous increase that uh, science has lately been bringing within our reach. All the resources of science will be needed to tide over the period till uh, human, the population of the planet stabilizes again and uh, science will be paralyzed and uh, inhibited from uh, producing its effect if for purposes of producing and uh, distributing food the world remains divided up into about a hundred compartments, um, each under a government that has sovereign power to decide what shall or shall not be done about uh, uh, producing food within its own frontiers and uh, distributing it to other parts of the world. So uh, for at least those two uh, urgent purposes, uh, some kind of world government uh, will be needed and needed soon. And um, it is true that, um, as we know from uh, 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 the history of all federations, uh, it is very difficult, perhaps impossible, to establish a common government uh, unless behind that common government one has some minimum uh, common ethical standard governing our dealings with each other because government rests on uh, uh, common moral understandings and uh, it's difficult to have uh, common government between people whose uh, moral ideas are very different from each other. Uh, but um, a, a, common, uh, a common morality uh, does not uh, necessarily require uniformity in all other departments of social and cultural life. World government does presuppose uh, a common sense of responsibility for the survival of the human race. Subject to that, it uh, allows us uh, many differences in manners and customs, uh, much variety which is part of the salt of uh, human life. So I suppose our aim should be uh, political and ethical unity, anyway for minimum uh, urgent purposes, uh, leaving room at the same time for social and cultural variety in all fields where unity is not going to be in the atomic age a necessity of life. Um, variety in uh, fields where unity is not necessary is uh, surely desirable because human nature itself is uh, uh, varied. Um, suppose that our local differences in manners and customs were to be uh, completely ironed out uh, owing to the uh, increase in uh, uh, facility of means of communication. That is a possible thing that one might uh, uh, foresee in the not uh, too remote future. Uh, there would then still be innate differences between uh, different uh, psychological types of human being. Um, the psychologists are only at the beginning, I suppose, <coughs> of the exploration of the uh, interior depths of human nature. Uh, uh, a field which is as vast, this psychic field, as the uh, physical field of uh, outer space, because inside uh, each human being there is uh, a psychic immensity which is comparable in its immensity and complexity with the um, uh, out physical uh, outer space. And the uh, psychologists who have been the pioneers in our time of this exploration seem, or anyway, some of them seem to find that um, in any sample of the human race, you will find uh, um, people of certain different uh, psychological types represented uh, all through the uh, population of the world. And each of these uh, types, according to the psychologists, has its own uh, particular cultural and uh, social needs. I fancy that the strength of the historic world religions uh, may be that um, each of these religions appeals to one or other of the uh, basic uh, human psychological types. It would account for their variety and account for their extraordinary persistence because, of course, uh, the world religions have uh, had a far longer history than even the longest live of the uh, existing uh, uh, states of the world. Um, political institutions uh, 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 so far have been pretty short-lived uh, uh, in history. Religious institutions, by comparison, have been much longer-lived, perhaps because uh, uh, a good religion uh, uh, ministers to needs that are deeper than uh, political needs, which are rather on the surface of human life uh, compared to the inner life of the spirit. Um, 
I therefore think it is one of the uh, uh, historic religions where to drive all the rest off the field, uh, human life would be impoverished. What I would hope would be that uh, uh, the world religions in this age of increasing communications will know more about each other and know more about each other, not in order to disapprove more of each other or to dislike each other more, but in order to um, uh, have more sympathy with each other, to value each other more, and to learn more from each other, perhaps without uh, losing their separate historic identities. And so to allow much greater freedom of choice to uh, uh, individuals uh, as they go on in life to choose uh, among the world religions uh, which religion uh, suits them best. Up till now, our religion has been a matter of accident, the extraordinary accident of birth, the time and place in which we have to be born, has made us a Muslim or Jew or Christian, whatever it may be. That is rather an irrational way of uh, acquiring one's religion. I think our descendants may have much greater power of choice in choosing the religion that uh, uh, is for them the door to uh, uh, communication with uh, whatever the higher spiritual presence uh, is in the universe that is beyond and above man. Uh, I think back to the competition between uh, different missionary religions for converting the population of the uh, Roman uh, uh, would-be world state. Uh, if you look at the history of the Roman Empire, it's the religious history that is the live part of its history. Uh, the Roman Empire was a remedy for a state of uh, long continuing war and revolution which had almost uh, extinguished uh, uh, Greco-Roman civilization before the Emperor Augustus uh, imposed his peace on the Mediterranean world. And as the cost of imposing peace, he had to put uh, politics to sleep and to a certain extent uh, economics uh, to sleep. He had to uh, freeze to some extent <coughs> the material side of life because that was a lesser evil than the extreme degree of warfare and uh, revolution which had been till that time threatening the uh, uh, destruction of civilization uh, around the Mediterranean basin. But uh, since uh, human nature uh, ca cannot do without freedom in some sphere, freedom under the Roman Empire uh, broke out in the field of religion. And the real history of uh, the Roman Empire is the history of the competition between uh, the rival oriental religions which were coming in from the east and were competing for the conversion of the Greeks and Romans. Now, in that competition, which lasted for about three centuries, the victor, uh, Christianity, did, uh, it is true, eliminate um, the rest. But it eliminated them uh, partly by absorbing elements and very important elements of them into itself so that some of uh, the uh, uh, original variety of uh, uh, religion in the Mediterranean uh, world uh, under the Roman Empire uh, has survived unto our day uh, inside Christianity. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, two of the rival religions were the worship of the Egyptian goddess um, Isis and of the um, 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 Asian goddess uh, Sibylle. Um, Isis and Sibylle were uh, officially uh, uh, abolished, but they live on in the worship of uh, the Virgin or the Mother of God in uh, many branches of the Christian Church. Uh, the soldiers of the Roman Empire were um, addicted to the worship of uh, two uh, military gods whom they found uh, on the eastern frontiers of the Roman Empire, the Persian god Mithras and the Syrian god uh, Jupiter of uh, place called Doliki. Um, the um, ideals embodied in the worship of Mithras and uh, Jupiter Dolichinus uh, live on in the uh, ideal of the church militant. Militant, of course, uh, not in the physical uh, uh, military sense, but in the uh, spiritual uh, and logical meaning of, of militant. Um, that change from um, um, literal military militancy to missionary militancy I think the classical example of that comes uh, characteristically from uh, India. Uh, India in the third century before Christ, when uh, India, uh, as like contemporary China, was uh, almost uh, united under the rule of a single state. And an Indian emperor, the famous emperor Ashoka, uh, inherited this state at a time when only the southern tip of the peninsula of India 
uh, remained outside this united Indian Empire. And like uh, many rulers of uh, empires, he yield, uh, Ashoka yielded to the temptation to try and reach so-called natural frontiers by conquering and annexing uh, the rest of the peninsula, and so making a single state out of the whole of India. So he deliberately made war on the nearest of the still independent uh, Indian states. And having made this war, uh, he was so horrified by the uh, crime and uh, evil of war that he uh, renounced war for the rest of his reign, and uh, uh, though he continued to be a conqueror, he became a conqueror in quite a different medium. He became a convert to Buddhism, and uh, he uh, spent the rest of his energies and the resources of his empire in propagating Buddhism to Ceylon and to Central Asia. It's thanks to Ashoka that uh, Buddhism is today the religion of about um, half the human race. Um, how are we to bring about uh, mutual acquaintance, leading to mutual confidence, mutual esteem, and uh, mutual affection? I think the only sure way is a slow way, and that is perhaps rather a formidable answer to have to give because um, we obviously have not much time to spare. But I think the only sure way of uh, producing mutual confidence is the knitting up of uh, uh, personal relations across our traditional tribal frontiers. And hence the importance of the interchange of tourists, of students, and of uh, members of the different professions, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, civil servants, teachers, engineers. Um, the exchange with people of uh, the same profession is very important because uh, having a common profession is a common bond which uh, uh, oversteps the differences between uh, nationality, uh, religion, uh, race, uh, language, all the other barriers that divide the human race. <laughs> because uh, the members of a profession all over the world have something in common with each other. Now at the end of the Second World War, the uh, uh, government of this country made uh, very far-reaching proposals to the Soviet government for uh, systematic interchanges of uh, this kind, um, rightly and truly feeling that this was the substantial and solid, uh, enduring way of uh, building up uh, confidence and friendship. Uh, unhappily, at that time, the Russian government uh, drew back and was shy of allowing its people to uh, mix with our uh, Western people. Uh, Today, there seems to have been a certain thaw, and it, it is uh, more easy, but not only for us to uh, travel in uh, uh, communist countries, but uh, it is also easier for the citizens of communist countries to uh, come out and uh, travel in uh, our Western countries. That, I think, is a happy and encouraging sign. Uh, long may it continue and may it increase, because uh, only by uh, personal acquaintance with each other uh, and meeting each other face to face, recognizing in each other fellow human beings, can we overcome the uh, mutual uh, misunderstanding and suspicion which uh, is such a menace to us all. So I would say that the agenda for all our local governments should be uh, first, uh, the negative objective of making war impossible, a very important first uh, uh, interim uh, sort of provisional stage. Secondly, uh, trying to underpin that by positive uh, insurances of peace. Uh, first of all, putting the control of uh, uh, atomic energy in the hands of some uh, single world authority with effective paramount power uh, in this field over the local national governments. Let us suppose that uh, we are successful in uh, eliminating the possibility that atomic power will be used for uh, uh, Warfare. It is certain, I think, that uh, in the course of these next 2,000 million years, atomic power will be used on an enormous scale for peaceful purposes, as a source of power to be used for atoms for peace, in fact. But uh, we know that um, uh, the technical difficulty of using atomic power is the production of atomic waste. And we know that uh, uh, atomic poison uh, produces its effects uh, over thousands of miles uh, away from the source of the poison. In other words, you cannot deal with uh, the problem of uh, neutralizing the poisonous effects of atomic waste 
within the frontiers of 100 local national states. We shall only be able to deal with it on a worldwide scale. And therefore, even if atoms are only used for peace, the uh, use of atomic energy will presume some uh, worldwide authority for uh, uh, saving the human race from being contaminated by uh, atomic poison. And then I would say the third objective uh, should be to build up a world society by promoting a network of personal friendships. Personal acquaintance is needed to underpin all political arrangements. Um, here I would say that uh, I do think that the Peace Corps is the most uh, imaginative and uh, symbolic uh, uh, invention of uh, this country's. Um, the, the great difficulty, I think, for not just for this country, but for all Western countries, is that uh, by comparison with uh, the common run of the human race, we are very rich. And uh, every other line of the Gospels underlines the truth that wealth is an insulating factor. The ordinary human lot is to be poor. If you are rich, you are exceptional and unusual and um, you do not uh, understand at first hand the common lot of the human race, and this estranges you from uh, common humanity. The Peace Corps seems to me to be an attempt to, uh, on the part of young people in this country, deliberately for uh, several years of their lives to put aside their affluence and to uh, share the life of the poor majority of the human race, uh, living as they live, living hard, living under great uh, discomfort, even hardship, uh, in order to uh, work with them and to get to know them and to knit up the human race. It seems to me one of the hopeful things in the world today and uh, when I read accounts of its success I feel encouraged. Now a world community may sound uh, something uh, strange and difficult because since the beginning of human history we've been accustomed to living mainly in tribal communities. But uh, in conclusion, let me uh, repeat what I've said so many times tonight, that this is, in the long run, the only alternative to self-destruction in the atomic age that will be with us to the end of life on Earth. The atomic age will continue for as long as the human race continues. And uh, if we can adapt ourselves to living as a single world community in the atomic age, we have perhaps, as I say, 2,000 million years of human life on this planet ahead of us, as against the mere one million years uh, that we have lived on this planet uh, up to date. Long before this planet ceases to be habitable, a world community will, I believe, have uh, come to seem to our descendants to be the only conceivable kind of uh, human community. And they will find it hard to imagine how we could have lived uh, uh, split up uh, into uh, dozens and dozens of little warring tribes uh, during even the short uh, uh, one million years of the overture to uh, human history. So in casting up the balance sheet of human history today, I would say we are at the uh, end of the overture and at the uh, beginning of the first act of the real part of the play, and it is up to us to see that the first act is uh, not also the last act, which is really the first act of uh, uh, human drama that will spread over 2,000 million years if we in our time allow the human race to go on living. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Toynbee, for this challenging address. It would be superfluous for me to emphasize some of the, any of the points that you have made tonight. I know all of you are just full of wonder and questions and would like to ask him uh, something that is very deep in your heart and undoubtedly very profound. But there is the problem of the size of this audience. As I said at the outset, you could see me, and I can't see you, maybe that's not too bad, but I can't possibly pick out the hands that may be raised. 
Then there is another factor. Dr. Toynbee has had a very busy schedule. He arrived in Los Angeles yesterday. He was on television yesterday afternoon. He was interviewed by newspaper reporters, and then he had an address and a, a long discussion uh, at the First Congregational Church. He got up this morning in time to get to the campus to have a, uh, some more interviews, a luncheon with the uh, faculty of the history department who simply can't keep quiet when they get a man like Dr. <laughs> Toynbee around. <laughs> And from that he went to a seminar to, subject, to be subject to some more of precisely the same punishment. He went to dinner, or was taken to dinner by the Vice Chancellor this evening, and in the middle of the dinner, before he even got to his dessert, he had a long distance telephone call from the East. Uh, he will be taken home shortly tonight, tomorrow morning. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, he will fly north uh, to uh, give a lecture to Stanford in the hope that he can convert the barbarians up there. <laughs> he and his wife, therefore, I'm sure you all understand, are thoroughly tired, even though I know from what they have said, they are thoroughly thrilled with their reception uh, in Los Angeles. Finally, there is the tradition of this lecture, and that is that when the lecturer is finished, we allow him to depart in peace. And so, <laughs> Dr. Toynbee, I thank you again, and I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your very, very great attention.